Hello and welcome to The Bazooka. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at 10 OSCE station in one clinical course. Today we're going to be looking at surgery. This is season one, episode six. If you still haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications every time I post such videos. And please watch these videos till the end because there is a bonus question at the end and comment in the section below the answers and stand a chance to receive a textbook or any material that I have authored for absolutely free. It's absolutely free, the latest content that you may um, want on the market if you're a medical student. So grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, grab your notepad, and let's go. So from our previous um, episode, I left you a bonus question, and these are the answers. So the question was, what condition is in the picture? So this is Hepzusta ophthalmicus. This is, of course, affecting the fifth cranial nerve, which is the trigeminal nerve, and it's, of course, affecting V1. And what symptoms does one uh, present with? So before this eruption, where you get these vesicles on, a, an, on an erythematous base, you may get this prodrome where you have these tingling sensations on your forehead. And of course, this eruption will be limited across the dermatome. That's across V1. Remember that the trigeminal nerve is divided into the ophthalmic division, the maxillary division, and the mandibular division, V1, V2, and V3, respectively. You may also get some severe ocular pain. There may be some redness of the eyes. There may be photophobia. So these are symptoms. Okay, now they haven't yet asked you for signs, but I've put the signs there as well. So you may get market eyelid edema, you may get conjunctival episcleral as, as well as circumcorneal conjunctival hyperemia. You may even get corneal edema. What are some of the risk factors associated? So immunosuppression is a very big thing. So in HIV and AIDS patients, in patients that are taking immunosuppressive drugs, you also have some malignancies such as acute lymphocytic leukemias as well as age. This is common in infants, especially to mothers that have uh, the condition affecting their genitals. Then during birth, of course, then you, what are the complications? You may have keratitis, uh, you may have uveitis, you may have glaucoma, you may have cataracts, you may have corneal scarring, you may have episcleritis, you may have retinitis, and eventually there may be visual loss. So let's go into now today's episode and look at surgery station one. So on the left of your screen, you're given an image there. So a patient came in with the history of dysphagia and the barium swallow was performed and showed the following. What sign is shown in the picture and what is the diagnosis? Take a relevant history. What questions are you going to ask? What other investigations will you do to confirm your diagnosis? What are the treatment options? You can pause the video. If you are new to the channel, please pause the video at, right now and start screaming at your screen or writing down your answers and I shall give you a two second interval. Okay, so here comes the answer. So obviously this is known as a rat tail sign or you could refer to it as a, as a bird's beak sign. And this is obviously seen in achalasia. Remember achalasia cardia is a condition where the lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax. And when you're taking your, your history, you want to take your duration of the dysphagia. Was it the dysphagia initially for solids or for liquids? Um, did, is the dysphagia at the beginning of swallowing? Is it at the end of swallowing? Is it continuous throughout the patient swallowing? Is it associated with pain on swallowing? So is there any odynophagia? Is there any regurgitation of food? Is there any nausea, vomiting, or weight? You also want to find out the age of this patient. And if they have, of course, recently traveled to any area outside Zambia. What other investigations will you con will you do to confirm your diagnosis? So you want to perform an esophageal manometry, which is going to measure the lower esophageal pressures. You also want to do an esoph esophagoscopy, where you push in an esophagoscope and, um, of course, look at the esophagus. 
Then what are the treatment options? So you could use medical therapy, which is usually temporal. So your calcium channel blockers such as nifedipine and verapamil, or you could inject botulinum toxin, or definitively you could perform surgical interventions such as endoscopic pneumatic dilatation of the lower esophageal sphincter. This carries a risk of esophageal perforation. You may also do a procedure that's known as a helamyotomy, or you can call this as a cardiomyotomy, which is usually the definitive a treatment. Station two, what is your diagnosis? What are the A, B, C, D, E's of this condition? What are the main types of your diagnosis? And I, I, I presume they're saying histological types. In one, which one carries the best and worst prognosis? What is the management? So again, I'll give you a two second interval, study this image and then give your answers. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously a malignant um, melanoma. How we know that it's a melanoma is because it's dark in color. And it's of the type acral lentiginous uh, melanoma. So the ABCs is not airway breathing and circulation. No. The A stands for asymmetrical. So so there's, um, it's not affecting both body parts. It's also um, the B stands for borders, which are irregular. As we can see, the borders are irregular. The C stands for colored, so it's hyperpigmented. The D is for diameter, that's greater than 6 millimeters. The E is for elevation or an evolving lesion. So these are the ABCs of melanoma. Then what are the main histological types of your diagnosis in one and which one carries the best prognosis? and worst prognosis. So you have the superficial spreading, which carries the best prognosis, but other literature also suggests that the lentigo maligna melanoma also carries uh, the best prognosis. Then the nodular melanoma carries the worst prognosis. The acral lentiginous melanoma uh, is also another type, and then the amelanotic melanoma is also another type. So those are the, the five main types of um, melanoma. Then what is the management? So this depends on the stage as well as the grade of the tumor. But generally what we want to do is want to perform a wide local excision um, with uh, a graft plus or minus lymph node dissection. I hope you're doing very well at these OSCE um, stations. And if they are helping you, please drop a like on this video. Station three. So study this image. What is your diagnosis? What four questions will you ask on history? What are the findings you expect on examination? What are the four metabolic manifestations of this condition? So again, two second interval, you can pause the video now. And here comes the answer. So this of course is sigmoid volvulus. As we can see, this is like a coffee bean sign. Then what for uh, questions will you ask on your history? So you ask for a history of abdominal pains. You ask for a history of absolute constipation. So they are not going to be passing out any feces, they're not going to be passing out any flatus. Then you ask for a history of nausea, vomiting, or abdominal distension, and as well as ask for their last meal. Then what are the findings that you expect on examination? Remember, whenever you're asked such a question, you should picture in your mind like you're carrying out a normal examination. So what would you expect on inspection, on palpation, on percussion, and, and so on and so forth? So on inspection, of course, the abdomen will be distended. When you palpate, you're going to feel this tire-like feeling. Um, there's also going to be generalized abdominal tenderness as well as rebound tenderness in cases of a peritonitis. Then the abdomen may be tympanic to percussion. Then what are the four metabolic manifestations of this condition? So you may get hyponatremia, you may get hypochloremia. That's only because most of the secretions are being dumped into um the almost of um, the electrolytes are being dumped into the lumen of the intestines. That's kind of like under the pathophysiology of intestinal obstruction, which we shall cover later on in the chapter. You may also have hyperkalemia that's due to infarction of the bowel. Remember that the cells are bags of potassium. So once they die, they're going to be releasing this potassium in their bloodstream. But otherwise, generally, you may have a hypokalemia. You may also have a raised blood urea nitrogen in the body. So station four is another image here. So take, take your time. Um, you can pause the video and study this uh, chart here on the right. What are the uses of the chart shown above? List three tubes needed to be placed in order to use this chart. So here comes the answer. So this chart is used to, uh, is a fluid 
input output chart. So this is going to be used to monitor fluid balance in patients that have burns, in patients with renal failure, in post-operative patients, as well as in patients with dehydration and shock. As you have seen, most of these indications are surgical indications. And then list three tubes that you need to be placed in order for you to use this chart. So you need an IV line, of course, to run your fluids. You need a urinary catheter, of course, to... Um, measure the amount of urine that is coming out and you need an NG tube if you want to aspirate and measure the gastric aspirate or if you're pumping in fluid through um, that route. Then station five is another image. So study the image. As you have noted, surgery is about a lot of images. So you really have to focus on the images when you're looking or when you're studying through. There may be some questions here and there that may require a bit of some thinking, but the images are very, very good because surgery is more of an observative and a practical um course. So question one, describe the findings on the x-ray. What is your diagnosis? What is your differential diagnosis? What are the clinical features? How would you treat? So you can pause the video now and you should also increase the resolution on your video so that you can visualize this image properly. So here comes the answer. So this is a swelling, of course, it's also involving the soft tissue. Um, so you have a soft tissue mass or soft tissue swelling involving the distal area of the radius. So this is most likely an osteogenic sarcoma. The differential diagnosis of this would be, of course, a bone abscess. And how is this going to present? So there's going to be pain associated with a tender mass. There's going to be dilatation of the veins that may be visible over the skin, over the mass, and of course, constitutional symptoms of you having a tumor. Then... How would you treat? So, of course, surgery as well as chemotherapy. Station six, another image. What is the most likely diagnosis? What are the clinical features? What investigation would you do? Name three surgical procedures used in the management of this condition. So you can pause the video right now. So the answer for this is that this is most likely a bladder calculi or vesicle calculi or bladder stone, if you like. So what are the clinical features? So there may be frequency, there may be urgency, there may be hematuria, and of course, there may be suprapubic pain. And what investigations you want to do? You want to take an x-ray of the kidney, uh, ureters, as well as the bladder. You want to take an ultrasound of the kidney, ureters, and the bladder. You also want to perform a cystoscopy. Name the three surgical procedures used in the management of this condition. So you want to perform a transurethral cystolitholapsy. Um, as well as a percutaneous, a suprapubic uh, sister, systolitho, um, lapexy rather. It should be systolapexy. So you also want to uh, perform an open suprapubic uh, cystotomy. So you can use one of these procedures in managing this. The reason why we don't usually use extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy in bladder stones is sometimes it tends to be ineffective as compared to uh, renal stones. Station seven, what is your diagnosis? How would you manage? So here is another image. So what's wrong with this image? So here comes the answer. So obviously this is a depressed skull fracture as you can see the depression here. And how would you manage? You wanna cover this patient on antibiotics if there is of course associated um, lacerations to the skin. If they are convulsing, give them some anticonvulsants. You want to elevate the depressed skull fracture by drilling some burr holes that are made adjacent to the in the normal skull. And of course, you elevate the fracture. You're going to want to remove the bony fragments. If there's any necrotic tissue, please remove that. And then if there's any dural tears, you want to close those with interrupted sutures. Station eight, describe the findings from the x-ray above. What is the diagnosis? What is the management? So you can pause the video here. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel too as you are thinking about the answer for this station. This may come in your exam. So of course you have this air under the diaphragm. Under the right of the diaphragm, as you can see here, you are kind of like, it appears like there are two diaphragms here. You call this as a double diaphragm sign. You also see some haziness in the lungs here so this may appear like a ground glass appearance you can't really visualize the heart um, so well on this x-ray so most likely this individual here had a pneumoperitoneum so they had a perforation of a viscera in the abdomen 
and you visualize this as air under the, the diaphragm, the right side of the diaphragm. Then what is the management? So definitive management is surgery. Of course, you want to perform an exploratory, explorative laparotomy and um, you want to repair the perforation. Or you could actually, if the bowel is greatly affected or necrotic, you may actually resect it anastomose or you can resect and put a colostomy or a stoma rather. Station 9 is another image, image A and image B. Identify the signs above. I just realized that I've given you the answer on this question. So identify the signs above. So um, station A here or part A here is a coolant sign. And then part B here is the gray turner sign. List conditions that these signs are seen in. So in the coolant sign, you see this in retroperitoneal bleeding. You, you may see it in hemorrhagic pancreatitis. You may see it in ruptured ectopic pregnancies. And then the gray turner sign, you may see this in a retroperitoneal hematoma. Then what additional sign would you elicit? So you want to elicit a CARES sign. So this is obviously referred pain in the left shoulder. That's going to be due to irritation of the adjacent diaphragm. Apologies for giving you the answer preemptively on this slide. So station 10, look, study the image, describe the finding seen, what is the most likely diagnosis, how would you treat the condition? So you can pause the video at this moment. Okay, so here comes the answer. So station uh, 10, so this is obviously a smooth um, appearing uh, round swelling on the lateral aspect of the eye. This is most likely on the right side of the eye. And of course, what, this is most likely a dermoid cyst. So how would you treat this? Of course, by excision. You can perform an excision biopsy and send this to histopathology to confirm if it's not actually malignant. So here's your bonus question. Leave your answers in the comment and stand a chance to win a material um, written by myself, Dr. Kazevu. So this is an image of a patient with a painless lump in the neck. So describe the findings of the examination on inspection and palpation. What is the most likely diagnosis and what is the differential diagnosis? So please answer this question in the comments below. And do not forget to subscribe to the channel, drop a few likes, drop some comments, share this with friends that you may think they may benefit from. And stay tuned for episode 7. Thank you for taking your time.